Hello class, we're back with our uh, next practicum tutorial. Today we're going to be talking about view sheds, visibility analysis, and cumulative view shed analysis, uh, sometimes called visual scapes, depending on how you apply it. Uh, so we talked a lot about the theory of it on Tuesday, uh, so yeah, on Tuesday. So today what I'm going to do is to show you just how to actually do it in grass and um, I'm going to walk through a couple of different scenarios that we talked about, including just calculating a single view shed, calculating a cumulative view shed from a, from a set of known archaeological sites, and then how to calculate a, um, an approximation of a total view shed or the total visibility of the landscape in general. So we're working still with our Wadi Hasa data. I am in my Project 3 uh, map set that I made last time. And I'm just showing you right here the Wadi Hasa survey site points, and then this is the entire Wadi Hasa DEM, the 30 meter SRTM behind it. So, um, first thing I guess that I'll show you how to do is how to just make a single uh, view shed. So, we could, uh, well, we have a, a new tool, relatively new tool in terms of grass making, that does this relatively computationally efficient. There was an old tool, it took a very long time to do it, but now it's actually pretty simple to calculate a single. Um, view shed from one point. So what you have to do is to go to your raster menu to terrain analysis and then down to where it says visibility r dot view shed. The old one was called r dot los line of sight um, but luckily you don't have to choose that anymore in grass 7 2 and above I believe. Uh, so as always since I have my DEM highlighted over here it auto populates it here. If it's not in there you just choose it from your list. Uh, remember, you can manage your map sets so you can see or not see everything that's in your other map sets, but they're there, right? So really all you need is a single um, uh, elevation map, and then you need to put a name here. Um, obviously, I'm just going to put Ushed Site 1, all right? Um, and then you need to put in the coordinates of a viewing position east and north. And the easiest way to do this um, I'll show you how to query the site points to come up with, to highlight a specific set of sites. Um, but for now, what I'll do is I'll just zoom in somewhere over here, and I will use my query tool up here just to randomly pick one of these X's and to just click above it like that. And then I get my east and north location. I can right click on it, I can grab, just hit copy the coordinates, and then go back over here, I can right click and I can paste in place over here. So technically I'm ready to go at this particular moment, but let me just show you some of these other settings over here. Um, so over here in the tab that says settings, I can set my viewing elevation above the ground. So remember we talked about how the elevation above the ground surface actually matters. 1.75 meters is an average human height. If you are uh, on, a, on a watchtower or something, you might want to set this taller. If you're thinking about somebody crouched down, you might want to set it lower, right? So this is the viewing position. But the target position is also important. For example, um, do I want to just see the ground surface? Do I want to see any trees or any towers or anything that might be sticking up or human beings who are sticking up above the surface? I could, for example, enter 1.75 over here. And then that would be, um, could I see a human being standing on, on a ridge in a distance, right? Um, you could set a radius, a, a visibility radius. So if, for example, you're not interested in viewing anything beyond I don't know, five kilometers or something, you could put 5,000 in here. If you leave it at negative one, it'll just see as far as the eye can see. Which brings me to the tab that says refraction. Um, if you check this box, it will essentially take into account the fact that the atmosphere isn't perfectly clear, things get hazy in the distance, and that's what this coefficient is. You can look up different coefficients for different atmospheric conditions, haze, fog, etc., and you could enter that in here. I'll leave that box checked in and I'll leave the default for now. And then output format. You can change it to 0 and 1. I think by default it's 1 and null. All right, and then we talked about that. Um, well, maybe it's not right here. I'm going to check this one because I think 1 and null is probably the most um, uh, interesting way to do this. Um, then the other thing on the optional tab is to consider the curvature of the Earth. I always like to check that because the Earth is curved. So the math's a little bit more difficult to do this, but I think the results are a little bit better. Um, and of course, you can set your amount of memory. 
I'll just set it to 2,000 so it goes a little faster. I don't know that it will use 2,000 megabytes of memory, but just in case. And at this point, we're ready. So uh, I have my view shed, site one, my coordinates, etc. And I will hit run. And there we go. And computing visibility. And there you go. So what we have here is a map of the view shed of site one. So if I turn that off, there we go. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have checked that box because what it is, it sucked up the uh, elevation map from under there. So leave that unchecked and I'm going to overwrite and do it again. See, I confused myself. I tell you, it's always a matter of knowing which boxes to check. So again, don't get discouraged if you um, if you're doing it one way and it's not turning out right. Always you can experiment. All right. So, and it looks like it still did that. So maybe I needed to check that box to get it to be binary. So let's try that again real quick. There we go. So now I can click that's one and zero, see? So now I have everything visible is one, everything invisible is zero. And what I could do if I wanted to overlay this so that I could see that underneath. Uh, what I would do is I'd go back to the properties of my view shed map and I go to my selection over here um, and I would just put one and apply. So it would only show category one over here. So you see, there we go. A single view shed from our input location. We can see mostly the north bank. That's what we're looking at over here. So that's pretty cool. And you can see how if we do another uh, site point, so I'll just pick this guy over here like that. And I'll copy this one over here and I'll go back here and I will now delete that and put in the new coordinates and I'll put site two and I'll run that. And we'll do its thing. Now we can see a different overlay over here. And I'll do the same thing. I'll go to my properties, go to my selection, and just look at cat one. So what we can't see is because they overlap a little bit, but essentially if I undo and redo like that, we can see that they can see partially some of the same areas, but partially some different areas, especially site one has a much bigger view shed than site two did. So let's talk about that idea about cumulative view sheds. Let's do it manually real quick with just our two sites. And then I'll show you how to automate the process for a greater number of sites. So what I'll do is I'll just go into the uh, map calculator, our map calc, and I will very simply just insert my view shed site one, and I will just add it to view shed site two right here. And I'll put, in it cum v shed right just a name i made up and we will hit run over here and now we will get a map if i query i will get values of zero where both of them can't see i will get values of one where only one of them can see and i will get values of two where two of them can see all right uh, and as you can see i could do this uh, manually and infinitum three sites, four sites, five sites. And every time the maximum number of uh, uh, potentially view, um, uh, maximum number that I would get is potentially the same number of view sheds that I would input. So in this case, I have two view sheds. The maximum number will be two. If I had three, the maximum number would be three, four, it would be four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can do that manually, but luckily you don't have to. I've created a little add-on module that, that automates the process for you. And be warned, this would take a long time with a lot of sites, right? So we'll do a couple of things here to get beyond that. So what I'm going to do is to just uh, make all of those invisible. And I will show you how to get the little add-on tool. You go to Settings, Add-ons, Extensions, Install Extensions from Add-ons, G.Extension. Um, and here there's actually quite a number of little plugins, little add-on modules. They function just like normal grass modules once you install them. You can take a, a look through all of them if you want. There's also info on the grass add-ons website you can Google that. 
Um, do you want to do is scroll all the way down here to the bottom to find the one that says r.viewshed.cva, cumulative viewshed analysis. And then you can hit install. If you're on the lab computers, it might already be installed. Otherwise, it won't install it. It may try and reinstall it to a newer version, although I think most of them are at the newest version at this moment. Now, this is, like I said, a little module that I made uh, that I make available. This is part of the open source movement. This is how we give back to our projects. When we come up with a good workflow, we can script them. I do this in the Python programming language. And then I can make it available for other people like you to use. So that's a really nice thing that we can do. Um, if we go to our modules tab, you might or you might not have an add-ons uh, tab down here. If you do, you can find it. Otherwise, you can go to your little terminal and you can type in r.viewshed. CVA, and then you want to put an ampersand, which will make the little module pop up. And you hit Enter, and it'll take a little second, and then there you go. Same thing, I could have just double clicked over here, and it would have popped up for me. Now, for some reason, not all versions of Grass, or not all installations of Grass, has this add-ons. Um, so if yours doesn't, don't freak out. Just type it into the command line over here, um, or the console tab over here. You could type it right here. And hit yeah. Oops, did I type it right? Anyway, you should be able to type it in over here, and it should pop out. Uh, the command line is probably the best way, just to make sure it works. Um, so here you go. You have uh, a new interface over here. It looks very much like the regular R Shed interface. I basically copied it. So you pick the same thing. You pick your Hasa 30 uh, DEM. Now you can pick an input vector map, and now you have an output cumulative view shed map. All right. Um, so what we need is actually an input vector map. Now, I could give it the entire survey database, but that's a lot of site points, and it wouldn't be particular meaning, particularly meaningful. What we'll want to do is to query out a little subset of these sites to come up with an archaeologically, a culturally meaningful sample of sites to where we might be interested in the results in the cumulative view shed analysis. So there are a couple of ways to achieve this. Probably the first and easiest way, and probably the first thing you should do, is to just select the Wadi Hassa Sites vector file here, and then open up the attribute table for it, like this. And you could just take some time to look through it, right? and you'll see all these columns. They mean something, and you have data in a lot of them over here. So we have a couple of columns that you might want to query on. Site number, not particularly meaningful. It's just an arbitrary number, but maximum length, like we were using before. That might be an interesting thing to query about. All big sites. Land code, um, not all of them have this, but some of them do. Are the sites on hilltops, on spurs, on ridges, etc. Right? Site type, that's really interesting. Village, there are little codes in here. Towers, farms, caves, all that kind of stuff. These codes are available in the Project 3 uh, file that you will download from uh, Blackboard. So you'll have a little code book to tell you what all these things are, right? Caves, tombs, aqueducts, um, all structures, farms, hamlets, platforms, right? All of these things, okay? And then you have all of these crazy looking, crazy title, crazy looking 0 and 1 binary data categories. These are time periods, and there's also a little bit of a code for that as well, and you'll get access to that. But this is, for example, Byzantine, uh, Byzantine and Mamluk, right? Abbasid uh, dynasty, Chalcolithic, Early Bronze Age, Early Bronze Age one, that kind of thing, right? What's really cool is built into this table, you have a little query, an SQL query tool, and it works according to this language called SQL, which is a database querying language. It's pretty standard. I'll show you some more examples of it here in a second. But all you have to do, the simplest way to query, just one attribute at a time, you click here where it says select star from WHI sites where. That's SQL query language. So let's pick something. Let's pick, um, let's pick a time period. I'll pick EB, all early bronze sites. And since that category is a binary, 0 or 1, we'll just put the number 1 in here. So that means. Any uh, value in this column EB, center, I think this column EB that's one, it's going to pick that out. 
So we hit apply and now we see all of them are ones that are highlighted here. And it temporarily hides all the other ones and it actually highlights all your EB sites, right? So there we go, all EB sites where um, are present now and highlighted. At this particular point, um, one thing that we could do is we could right click here and we could put extract selected features and we could give a new name EB sites like this and we could add that map to the layer tree boom and so now over here I have a brand new site uh, point map and I can just change the symbols let's say change it from an X to a circle and the color um, fill it with red like that click OK right there we are all of our EB sites right now what we could do if we wanted to do again we could now select EB sites open the attribute table and we could pick a different thing over here for example we could pick um, site type over here and we could look at site type and we could say mm, I'm really interested in um, well, let's see how about the ones that say farm, right? F-A-R-M. And you have to put quotes around that because it's text. If it's numbers, you don't have to put a quote. I put single quotes, you can put double quotes, doesn't matter. So you hit apply, there you go. And now I could do the same thing. I could right click here, and I could click extract selected features, and I could put EB farms, right? Like that, and click OK. And close that and now I have EB farms and I can do the same thing I can um, go to properties I can change it to let's make them let's make them little squares and I'll color these guys in yellow like this so boom, those are our little yellow square farms right only about four or five of them interesting very interesting okay so now you're asking yourself well do I have to do this in these stages and make all these interim maps? Can I do it in one fell swoop? And the answer is yes. You can absolutely do it in one fell swoop. And I'll show you how. So basically what you have to do is to do a, a direct vector query. So we go to our vector menu, we go to feature selection, and then we go to oops, select by attributes, v.extract. And essentially here you pick the map that you want to query. So I'll go back to our WH sites. You put the um, output. So I'll put EB farms 2 and we will see if we can get the same exact map to come out. Um, all the magic is in the selection dialog over here. So we'll click it here. Make sure that layer is 1 so that the table is here. You don't have to do this but I just for safety's sake like to uncheck everything. If this is a points map there's only points in there. But let's say you had one that had points in line and you only want to select the points. You can do that here. And then right here, we can enter the uh, SQL search uh, string. And we have to do this manually, a little different from the way that um, we did it you know, in the, in the table app, uh, where it had a pull-down menu. So you have to know the names of the categories or the attributes that you want and the values that you want. Um, but basically, what I can do is to put two search uh, criteria together with a logical operator, an AND or an OR or something like that. So in this case what I will do is put, uh, I'll put a parenthesis, and I'll put EB space equal 1 and I'll close that parenthesis and then I will write AND lowercase parenthesis um, site underscore type all caps equals with a space and another space put my quote and I will put farm and I'll cap because that was what was in there and then I will close that right so I have e uh, this is my where so select star from Wadi Hasa sites where and then I enter it here EB is one and site type is far okay and so what I will do is I will hit run and then we'll go boom like that and we actually saw it pop up over here in fact, they're right on top of it. So I have EB Farms 2, and I'll set my properties. I will set my color to blue in this case, and then I will set my symbol to well, blue pluses like that. Click 
click OK. And now we can see all those things are perfectly overlapping with each other. So basically had the same result, but one less interim map if I wanted to do it this way. And the real cool thing is that with vExtract, I could actually add to my query over here. So if I bring back up my little, uh, uh, whoops, if I bring back up my little table over here and I, of EB sites, and I go over to site type, and I see farm, I also see village, and I see down here, I saw hamlet. So maybe I want to include villages and hamlets in my um, collection, right? So I could potentially do, uh, do that here with an or statement. So I would have to put a, I think I would have to put a, a, a sorry, a parentheses there and put or, and I'm just gonna do a little shortcut over here. I'm gonna copy and paste these guys like this. Or copy and paste like this. And I'll close it, making sure I have the right number of parentheses at the end there. And I'm gonna change farm here to be HMLT. And I'm gonna change this farm to be VLLG, I believe. Let's just make sure I'm doing that right. And hopefully this will not give me an error. Uh, oh, oh, attribute. I'm going to change that to uh, overwrite right there. Boom. Yeah. All right. And so now I have done that, and I have an additional number of them. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my farms two properties, and I'm going to change that to something bigger so we can see. And I think I'll change the color to um, orange so we can actually see it brighter. We'll click OK. Yeah. So there we go. So now we have orange out there. And in fact, what I'll do is I'll just shut all these down so you can see that, right? So now what I've built there is a, a, a much more complex query. So I'll just show you that again right here. So we're, I got sites that are EB and where the site type is farm or where the site type is site type is village or where the site type site type is hamlet and you just have to pay attention to where your parentheses are in this case i needed to have the extra parentheses here because of this and operator um, because and and or kind of work in different ways so you if you want to do an and with a bunch of ors you have to make sure the order of operations works just like arithmetic if you need them to be um, happening separately, you have to enclose them in parentheses, right? So that's what I did here. So basic uh, querying with SQL, and a couple of different ways to do that, uh, slightly perhaps operationally simpler way, but one that can get you uh, more nuanced results over here and with less steps. In the end, I now have a site, a set of sites. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sites. And that is what I can enter into my rviewshed.cva. So that's my EB Farms 2 over here. And I can put EB Farms Cume V Shed. Right? Always have informative names over here. There are some optional things over here. I will check the curvature of the Earth. I will check, consider atmospheric uh, rarefraction. And then I'll leave pretty much everything else out the same as I've set the defaults 1.5, 1.75 meters above the ground, you know, 2000 RAM, whatever it is, it should be just fine. And we will hit run over here. Um, now, one thing that we could do is to have set the G region before this so that we don't take into account the whole region that would have speeded things up. Uh, so, I always recommend that you do that. Uh, in this case, it's going to take some period of time. It's not going to have a lot of output over here to tell you that it's working, but as long as it doesn't say finished, it's working. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to hit pause on the video while this happens. And when it comes back, it could take a, a number of, you know, a number of minutes here to, to do it. When it comes back, I'll show you the result. Okay, actually, it didn't take too long. It only took about three or four minutes on this computer. This is my big desktop computer in my office. Um, 
when it's done, it'll look like this, right? It'll say calculating cumulative view shed map, removing temporary view shed maps, command finished. It only took one minute and 19 seconds uh, on this particular computer. Um, you'll notice it didn't add the map as normal over here, and that's normal for add-ons. You have to just go in and manually add it. So what I will do is I'll add vector map, uh, or sorry, add raster map, and I will go find my uh, EB Farms cume view shed map. And there we go over here. Um, so what we have here is several uh, values. So again, zero is one is areas that aren't seen from any of them. And then I'll query around in here, three, four, four, one, two, et cetera. Theoretically, the max should be nine, but doesn't seem like I have that uh, in this particular map. What I can do is very quickly look at a histogram of that particular map, and I can actually see maximum value in this case is actually just four. Um, however, the maximum theoretical value is nine. So um, that's pretty cool. Now the question is, is that meaningful? So what I'll do real quick actually is put this over a hillshade so that it makes some, uh, makes some visual sense to you. So I'll put this, whoops, go to this guy and shaded relief. I find my uh, hillshade, which is back here somewhere, shade times two, and then I'll find my that. And I'll probably brighten this by about 40. And I'll hit OK. And there we go. All right. So now we can actually see, and I'll put that down below the sites right there. So now we can actually see the cumulative view shed that results from, from this particular analysis over here. So this is pretty cool. Um, let me just zoom in a little bit over here, like so. And we can actually see. Some very interesting patterns. They all seem to have a pretty good view of some of the tops of this north rim of Wadi Hassa. So now the big question is, is that significant uh, culturally? Were they really locating their sites so that they could view, have a nice view in that particular direction, but not a view in the other direction to the south? Or is that just the way the land is? All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is to calculate a total view shed. So I'm just going to I'm going to zoom out just a little bit more. Let's see here. I'll find a nice sort of compromise so that this goes by a little bit quickly. And what I will do is I'll set my region right here, set my computational region extent from display. So now I'm going to be constrained to just working in what I'm looking at right now. So there are a couple of different ways to do this. I could do a total random sample and I could do a cumulative random sample. But the first thing that I'll want to do is to figure out how many cells I'm working with over here. So what I'll do in this particular case, I will go to raster, reports and statistics, and I'll just do um, R Univare right here. And I'll pick my uh, SRTM, and I'll just hit Run over here. And basically what I have is an N for the number of cells right here. And what we can see is I have 2,1049,404 cells. And so what you'll have to do is to figure out how, what kind of compromise you're going to make in terms of the number of viewing points that you're going to use to calculate the total view shed for this. Statistically, you could take a 1% sample or something like that, and you can get 2,149 sites. That might make some sense. Um, in my case, I'm going to take a 0.1% sample just to speed things up, and it will probably be perfectly f reasonable, the result, okay? So that means I'm going to pick 200 and actually 215 viewing locations. Uh, and that's very simple to do with, um, well, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but probably the easiest way is to go to generate points under vector, so vector generate points, and then I could do generate random points, v dot random. And here I'll put um, two, I'll put rand points 215, so I know what it is. I don't want that dash, I want it to be an underscore. And here I'll put 215, right? And in this case, I'll leave 
pretty much everything alone like this and I'll just hit run and now you'll see 215 random points have been um, created so I'll just make them white so you can see them 215 random points right so I could use those that's one way to do it uh, maybe I want to do a stratified random sample so I only want to pick sites that are within the same general area as the sites that I have here. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to create a, uh, a convex hull around that. And I'll show you what that means here in a second. So I'll go to vector and I'll go to generate areas from point convex hull v dot hull. And I will pick my EB farms 2 and I'll put EB farms hull around that. And we will hit um, we'll create a flat hull. I like to do that instead of it's just in case they're 3D. I don't think they are, but we'll just do that. We'll hit run. And now what you'll see is I created an area that encompasses all of those um, particular points like that. And what I will do is I will turn that into a raster. So I'll go to my file uh, menu. I'll go to map type conversions, vector to raster, v.2.rast. I have my hull here, and I'll just copy this, and I'll paste it here, and I'll just put rast like that. And the source of the values will just be val, and that way down here in the attributes, um, I could actually pick a column if I wanted to, but otherwise, it will just put whatever value I put in this optional value field right here. And I'll just hit run. And essentially what I've done is I've turned this vector into this raster over here. Okay? And the reason why I did this is because I also want to buffer a little bit around this particular one. So I will go to Transform Features, and I will go to Grow, and then I will put copy and paste over here and I will put buffer like this so this is r.grow from the raster menu and then I will give a radius and raster cells I will put a hundred raster cells around it and I'll hit run and there we go so that's what I did what I did is I did convex hull that goes right to the outside edge of all of the points and then I turned that into a raster, and then I grew it with a buffer with r.grow, just so I have a nice little area around it right here. And now I'll go to Raster Menu, Generate Random Cells, and I will go to this Random Cells and Vector Points r.random, and I will put my 215 points in there, and I will pick that uh, buffered convex hull as the name of cover raster map right here, cover on the optional tab. And then I'll give the name for the output vector map be um, hull random 215. Hit run like so. And now you will see 215 points picked only within my convex hull that was buffered by 100 additional cells around the outside. Okay, so now I have that, that, and that. I can do one more randomization. This will not create a total view shed, but it may be useful for testing hypotheses about those specific locations. And that is to randomly move my input sites in the X and the Y direction. To do that, I will go to Vector. I will go to uh, Generate Points. And I will go down to where it says Perturb Points, V.Perturb. And now I can pick my actual EB Farms 2. And I'll put EB Farms, sorry, Farms Perturbed. Right? And then I can put some parameters in over here 
the sort of number uh, distance that it will do it. So I'll just put 10 over here. Um, and I could pick a distribution. I'll pick a normal distribution instead of a uniform. And I could change some few things over here. Um, but basically, this should be fine. If I hit run, whoops, what did I do? Error scanning arguments. Pause. I'll be back in a second. All right, sorry. A little bit of a, uh, a brain fart. <laughs> I forgot that you have to put both the X and the Y direction. So you can perturb them in uh, more than one direction here. So here I'm just putting 10 comma 10, all right? And now when I hit run, it actually does it, okay? So now let's compare, for example, our perturbed to our unperturbed. So I'll just change these to, just change them to white X's and click OK. And you see, they didn't really move that much. So what I probably need to do is to up the um, number, the amount by which I perturb them. So I'll go back and do that. VPerturb, and I'll pick that output right here. And I will do 100 by 100, like so. And I will overwrite here. What did I do? EB I picked the wrong map as the input map. EB Farms 2. Now I hit run. There we go. And even 100 wasn't enough. So I will change this to 1,000 by 1,000. Normal distribution. There we go. Normal distribution sometimes picks smaller values over any random value. So there we go. So basically what I can do is I can randomize this, and I can do it a bunch of different times, randomizing them a little bit. So basically same number of points, but slightly randomly picked, but in the vicinity of the original sites. And I can use all three of these things to create um, total view sheds or comparative cumulative view sheds. And essentially all I have to do is to go back to our view shed CVA and pick my input vector map. So I'll pick, uh, I'll pick the perturbed ones, like so. Cume view shed perturbed, like, sit, like this. And I will hit Run. And then I'm going to pause you just for that minute that it's going to take. OK, we are back. And while I, did, uh, while I was away, I cleaned up uh, all my interim maps over here. So I'm just going to add the new perturbed view shed, like so. And now we can kind of go back and forth and compare these things. So we could use our map slider too, if you remember, under the file menu to the map swipe. And we can pick our perturbed on the one side and our uh, unperturbed on this side. And we can uh, we'll make this big like so. And we can swipe back and forth. Well, where's our Where's our swiper, swipe mode, or mirror mode, swipe mode? OK. So, and we can sort of zoom out a little bit like this, and we can swipe back and forth like, like this. And we can actually see there are some differences. There may be more visibility in our perturbed map than our unperturbed map, which is kind of interesting, along the north rim. So interestingly, maybe the hypothesis that they were trying to see the North Rim isn't the right one. Maybe it was they were actually trying not to see the North Rim. It's just that the North Rim is very visible. So that's a new hypothesis that we could test over here. The other thing we should check out is what the max value is over here. So just a quick way to do that, again, is to look at our histogram. And here we have four as well, right? So max value hasn't changed that much. Um, what we'll do now is go back to our view shed, our view shed, and we'll calculate the total view shed, but we'll use our stratified random sample uh, inside that convex hull that we calculated. Um, so what we'll do, oh, sorry, this is our view shed. I need um, our, I need. I need our view shed CVA again. So I'll grab my my 30 meter SRTM. Grab my uh, 
EB no, 215 in the whole random, and I'll put total V shed 215 whole right here. And I'll just do this and this, and I'm going to hit run, and I'm going to pause you again while that's going. Okay, during that short to you break, 22 minutes has passed for me, and my total view shed map from my stratified random sample has finished. You see, I had to wait for that. So if you're going to do this in the lab or on your own computer, just let it go. All right, go get a coffee break or something like that and come back. And not until you see this uh, calculating cumulative view shed, temporary view shed maps will not be removed. Command finished, right? Command finished is what you're looking for. So let's add that map in. Let's add that map in. Whoops, this guy right here, d.rast. And then, what did I, I can't even, 22 minutes ago, I can't even remember what I called it. I called it, um, I think I called it, not init cumulative view shed. Actually, I'll go over here. See, this is funny. This is what happens. You forget what you've done. I called it total view shed 215. All right. I will find it in my map right there. Total view shed 215 hull. Okay. And uh, somehow I zoomed that out. Okay. So there we go. All right. This is our map right here. So if I query around, I'm going to get values of like 57 and all that kind of stuff. So let's do our little histogram like that. And we will see. Actually, we should do the other histogram like so. We will see we have some values in the high 20s pretty, pretty interestingly over here. I can also do very quickly r.stats, which should be here, and I can just hit run. And whoops, I need to, where is the deal here? Print cell count. And uh, uh, I always free. I don't use this tool so much, but let's see. Number of categories is one. And uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Number of floating point categories should be yeah, average values. Yeah, now we're getting it. Okay, so we have some values of 80 some values of like 93, right? So we actually have some places that are pretty highly visible. Now the big question is how to compare this with the max value of let's say 93. I suppose I could have just added a raster legend like so. And you see all of these crazy, <laughs> all of this crazy stuff over here. If I just uh, go to this guy over here and Specific values, uh, draw smooth gradient. There we go. So I got 93. Yeah, 93 is the top, right? Versus the um, cumulative view shed from the farms, which had a max value of like 9, right? How do I compare 93 to 9? Well, what I have to do is to normalize them. I have to divide by the theoretical maximum both maps. So I'll go back to my raster map calculator like so and I will pick my uh, total view shed and I'll divide by 215 and I'll give the name of total v shed hull, sorry 215 hull, 215 hull normalized like so and Let's just see what happens over here. So it's all red, but I mean all yellow. So what did I do? What did I do wrong? I think I needed to put the point behind here. Remember about floating point value, so I need this to be 215.0. Hit run. There we go. Always got to troubleshoot what happens. And now when I query, as we see, I'm getting values between 0 and 1. So if I click over here, I'll get values of 0.38. So I won't have any values of 1 because I didn't have any values of 215 in the map. But 215 is 
the maximum number of sites I put in, so that's the maximum number I have to put in. Now, let's do the same thing, but with our um, EB farm view shed, and I'll divide by 9, because 9 was the number of farms that I had here. And I'll just take a quick shortcut here to copy and paste this over here. Normalize like so. And now I can hit run. And of course, I forgot to put 9.0 like I just did last time. I hit run. And here we go. So now when I query this guy, I'm getting values between 0 and 1 as well. And what I can see is, just qualitatively, what I can see is basically this whole rim over here is visible. It's just visible. What's really interesting is that some of these other ridges are also visible, but they seem to be not that visible from our farms, right? Some of these areas right here in the middle. We could go on, we could go further, we could do some statistical overlays between the two of these things and uh, quantify exactly how the overlap is. Sometimes that's necessary, but for project three, it's not that necessary. You're just going to look at the two different ones and see how they're different. And of course, the map swipe that we did earlier is a good tool for doing that. So, basically, those are that's how you go ahead and do um, visibility analysis. And then we'll cover a lot in this particular um, tutorial, and I understand that. So I will be on hand tomorrow to go back over any of these steps with you um, to, to basically refresh them. The basic is you need a viewing point or set of viewing points, and you calculate the view sheds, and then you overlap them. To be able to compare two cumulative view sheds, quantitatively you have to normalize them, but you can compare them without normalizing them, just qualitatively looking at the visual patterns on the map. You should also plan to compare a cumulative view shed from a set of viewing points that are culturally meaningful to one that's generated from a random sampling. And that can be a total random sample, a stratified random sample, or a perturbation of the input sites you have now. If you do a perturbation, you might have to do multiple perturbations, what they call Monte Carlo or bootstrapping, and compare all of those perturbed results with your real results. All of these things are tools to help you basically figure out how valid your interpretation of the cumulative view shape you produce for your sites actually is. None of them disprove any hypotheses, but some of them can help substantiate some of your hypotheses, and they can also help shape your thinking about what the goal, one of the locational goals of what they were in people's minds when they actually located these sites really were. And we'll continue on with this when we get into doing the actual predictive modeling at the end of Project 3. See you tomorrow.